I'm going to go on now to talk about, about seed, uh, about disorders which we locate in the child. There's so much talk about the importance of the first thousand days, but there's really very little action. So I ask you, why do we fail to see that children have mental health disorders? I used to think it was because of the, the myth of childhood. People liked the, the, the belief that, that childhoods were, were perfect, and it's adults that need to have that myth. I think we've moved past that myth. I think people recognise that, uh, and I think largely through the child poverty rhetoric, we recognise that children are having difficult times in childhood. Are we not providing mental health care for children because the care of children is considered just that, care? And if it's care that we're providing, then that's the responsibility of families and not mental health services. But I'd like to convey that some children have mental health problems and that they need services just as, ch as children of old, earlier ages. I think this is a really confronting idea that children from a very young age have relationship disorders and infant mental health disorders with consequences which can run across their lifespans. So much talked about in child and adolescent mental health is the fact that mental health problems begin early and they have a high rate of demonstrated persistence across the lifespan. I think we've been quite slow in coming out with that fact and it's because of the problem of multifinality. Um, if you start with one disorder you can turn out to have another disorder and so there's a poor, there's a lack of continuity. Um, in the behavioural phenotype of disorder that you're seeing. But problems beget problems. So this slide is um, from the WHO and it talks about disability adjusted life years. So a, a daily, a disability adjusted life year is one year of lost healthy life. And it's on the basis of this that depression and mental health problems have, been consider have come to be considered one of the top three disorders in the world. And over 50% um, of mental illnesses begin before the age of 14 years. So this pink piece here, this is, this is mental illnesses. And you can see that at this point, so in the early years, say in the teenage years, they take up half of the burden. If you remember nothing else from the talk today, 50% of mental illnesses start before the age of 14 years. So what are infant mental health disorders? There are a whole range of them. Um, infant mental health has its own um, equivalent to the DSM-4 and the ICD-10. Uh, the latest edition is called the DC-03 and I've got a copy in my bag if anyone would like to have a look at it. But essentially it, it, instead of using DSM-4 and adult diagnoses and trying to translate them downwards, what it does is it attempts to describe them from infancy upwards so that we're looking for completely different things. For example, with, the exa um, with autism, which is generally first picked up by people's parents and by experienced parents, it's picked up by six months. But it can be picked up by specialists that early as well. Because at the time where children begin their, sh their shared gestural communication, children with true autism are beginning to demonstrate it. And the first sign that you'll see of gestural shared communication is when I look, you look. So that, that, sh that sharing of gaze. Um, but equally, when I point, we all look. Ba babies are doing this well before they're talking. There's also the other de neurodevelopmental disorders, ADHD, but there are also disorders of sensory um, processing, so both over and under responsiveness to smell, touch, noise. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about anxiety disorders because I think they're really under-recognised and they're enormously treatable. I also want to make the point that depression is apparent within the first three months of life. I see plenty of babies with flat affect um, and a sustained reduction in socialisation and withdrawal. I want to talk a little bit more about um, PTSD in children. Um, it's a very common disorder, particularly um, arising from medical ex um, instrumentation and um, NICU experiences. 
and I want to talk a little bit about relationship disorders. These are enormously painful and difficult to talk about for parents. The idea, it's an essential fear that what you do is damaging your child. Unlike the other diagnoses though, it's not a disorder which is seen as existing within a person. It's a disorder in which um, we identify the behaviour as sitting within the relationship and it can occur within one relationship. For example, oppositional behaviour with a preschool child, uh, sorry, with a preschool teacher. You could also see fearfulness, anger, aggression, food refusal, sleep refusal, role inappropriate behaviours such as being over solicitous or even over controlling. Just to give you an idea of um, an infant mental health, I'd like to describe a case. Um, hopefully it's sufficiently um, hard to understand who I'm talking about. This is a case of a feeding disorder. So th this, this girl was presented to infant mental health services at the age of one. Her parents um, were recent immigrants um, from overseas and the daughter, um, it, the, the pregnancy was um, conceived intentionally with the aim of saving the marriage. So the pregnancy was physically relatively uncomplicated as to the extent that pregnancies are. Um, but there was a really serious adjustment for these parents um, in changing from being a working couple um, to, being, uh, to being a couple in which parenting is, was their primary aim. They had no, funny, no family in New Zealand, very little money and, and, and very different notions of a woman's role. Uh, very significant change for her from working to not working. The mother had an enormous commitment to her child and her way of saving her marriage was making everything perfect. Everything was going to be perfect for this child. She was pre-morbidly anxious, there's no doubt about it, she had some obsessional traits. And, and people with experience working in this field would know that really perfectionism doesn't work very well when you move from being a working mother to being a parent. It's actually a risk factor for um, serious depressive illnesses. The father was actually doing his best in his traditional uh, model as well. He was working a lot. Unfortunately, this work, doing his best um, ultimately ended up with him having an affair, which is what part of what precipitated this crisis. This was a baby who was failing to gain weight. It was dropping, a, dropping and dropping its weight across um, growth lines. It had extensive investigations in hospital settings to try to determine if this, there was a medical cause for this. Um, but the fact was that the baby kept gaining weight in hospital and as a result hospital staff started to wonder whether there was something really kooky going on here. Was something, was something being done intentionally? Well, as the baby's milestones began to slip with less talk and some regressive behaviours and certainly less reciprocity, people became quite concerned about this relationship. But using an infant mental health approach, the first thing that was, was done was to actually use a video to look at the feeding experience that this baby had. So I'm, I'm really hoping I get the videos going for the next talk because use of videos is essential to infant mental health practice. And it was really through only watching a video of the mother feeding her child in her own home that you could really see how the high maternal anxiety and perfectionism was playing out in the relationship and the feeding. There was really poor pacing of her delivery of food and the infant's acceptance of it. This real rigidity in the provision of really healthy meals, way too healthy. Um, <laughs> there was a reluctance to allow the infant any autonomy um, or any self-feeding, mostly because mess was not allowed. It doesn't really look quite so good to uh, allow an infant to feed themselves. And the mother's failure to see, to, to have the baby accepting food from her was seen as a rejection um, and that lead, led to further self-recrimination on her part. And if you look at the baby you could see an anxious baby with a high intense diaphragm, stiffness in its limbs, not a baby that was actually able to easily take food on board and unfortunately a baby that um, often ended up with hiccups and vomiting. So having seen that video you could see that really there was a struggling mum and a struggling baby. And the, the, the approach that was taken in this infant mental health therapy was a triadic focus to build a network of support in which therapeutic efforts could occur to support the little baby to feed, um, to accept food from both mother and father. So by 
the mother being able to see herself in video, she was actually to, able to do a whole lot of her own work without anyone having to tell her what to do. She also had an opportunity to explore the narrative which had led to this situation, and she was able to see the faults in her own logic and in her perfectionism and feeding. Um, and the, fa the father was actually the one who was able to bring playfulness back into, into meal times, and together they were successful in feeding their daughter. I've added another story here because I understand that narratives are the best way to get people to um, change their minds on things. So I want to talk a little bit um, about post-traumatic stress disorder in infants because it's got very different manifestations in adults. In adults we observe traumatic re-experiencing as flashbacks and nightmares, but also avoidance, hypervigilance and a sense of foreshadowed, foreshortened future. And in infants there's, uh, there's no reports of internal experience and because trauma is often encoded in non-verbal memory, memories that are formed before infants are talking, it's encoded in sound and touch and smell and it's experienced much more explicitly in their body. Children are much, also much more likely to become preoccupied, ugh, preoccupied with rather than avoidant of things that have traumatised them. For example, repeatedly following touching dogs after you've been bitten. As a result of the difference between adults and infants, people um, are, are less perceptive at, at recognising post-traumatic stress. I'd like to tell you a little bit about a three-year-old boy who was the oldest of two children. Um, his parents were Pākehā New Zealanders. They had a relatively, I think they had a, a happy marriage and a well, they had a lot of support from their family. Unfortunately, this baby was born prematurely. Uh, but not, not, not extremely um, prematurely, but it did have quite a long stay in NICU and um, people who've got experiences of working in neonatal intensive cares will know that these are, um, these are situations in which infants are exposed to high rates of intervention mm -hmm. um, and mothers are experiencing quite uh, immense loss um, for the perfect baby, but also terrible recrimination about their, ba their body's inability to support their child. Um, and, and this mother was typical of that in that she um, continued to report very fresh tra trauma-based memories with very limited processing in a high affective state. The baby was making good progress though, was out of NICU, um, had gone home, was physically flourishing, but unfortunately it needed to return to hospital for another procedure. The baby didn't convey this as distress um, or in any externalising way. In fact, um, in the hospital setting it was frozen and staring, which was dissociative. And at other times you could notice a change in its skin colour and some, some mild sweating. There was also a reduced expression of positive emotions at home. The child was more clingy, wanted more cuddles, started having difficulty going to bed at night, and it also had returned to the parent's bed. Its toileting ability had gone down, it, um, and this was probably its most clear sign of regression. At three, this child had been dry for a while and it went back to wetting. And on first looks and in play therapy, this child wanted to play with medical equipment, and so, and, and it was doing so gently and appropriately, which on first look people said, so it's not that. But, but really it was through understanding that infants, um, when they have a traumatic experience, they, their, their focus comes to a preoccupation with the trauma. That really was very important in helping the parents understand their child's behaviour and their needs. It, it was very important to help the parents um, process their own emotions about it, as I mentioned, the maternal guilt and sense of failure, and also to re-narrate the hospital experience for her and for her family. Um, and, and this was done both for the parents, but also through therapeutic storytelling for the infant. And the, story, the storytelling was delivered um, during a course of EMDR, in which there was rhythmicity in the way that the story was given. And that's believed to help um, emotional processing um, in infants. Sorry, Tony, what's the MDL? Sorry, um, eye movement. Desensitisation response. Okay. So you see it in adults, it's done with um, often people just watching your finger, getting their eye movements going back and forward. You can't while, you're, while you're recalling while the trauma. While you're recalling the trauma. Hypnotic kind of way. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. 
So it's probably one of the most effective trauma-based therapies. Um, and it's done for children. It's done um, in, a, in a few small places. It's done for infants. And since you can't get infants to follow your fingers, um, they, you can have clickers that you can, can use clickers and get them to go from one light to the other light. Or you can do it um, through pattern and you can do it through ryth rhythmicity. And it's the rhythm that helps. It's, so, so traumatic memories are unprocessed memories. That's why they have that freshness that um, differs from normal memories. So if you think of childbirth as a good example of that, mm -hmm. um, childbirth memories typically soften um, and are contextualised, whereas birth trauma is not, does not soften. Um, and if you talk to somebody about it 18 months later, three years later, and a lot of um, women who've had babies in NICU, you can talk to them about it 18 years later. And they still describe it with a lack of coherence and an intensity um, as if it was still happening or they were immediately there. Um, it can be evoked by smells, it can be evoked by sounds. Um, and these memories are, are not laid down in the same way. And EMDR is believed um, to, through rhythmicity, help you um, reprocess the memory through the hippocampal memory system again and, and lay them down in a coherent way. Because the proximity of the ocular um, nerves to the, to the hippocampus and get it lighting up and, um, around the same areas. Is this all quite new stuff then? No. No, it's been going on for a long time. But we don't know about it. Oh, I don't well, know we, well, we, yeah, I mean, it takes about 30 minutes for a session. It's quite labour-intensive, like any other session. Not very, though, 30 not, minutes for a session. Not very. <laughs> yeah. But it requires people some... heard of it? Anybody no. here heard of it? Sorry. Good. OK. It requires <laughs> some skills around hypnosis, so you have to get the person to relax and then get back thinking yeah. what they're thinking and then the treatment is actually the, the eye movement and the, the treatment itself only takes a couple of seconds really. And it's very effective if you don't need a lot of sessions is what I understand. Yes. That's right. Yes. Four, four, when it works. Four, yeah, often yeah, four. Yeah. 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 So it's highly effective for specific traumas. Um, so well remembered traumas, car accidents, childbirth. Um, it's uh, probably less ex um, effective for what we call complex trauma. Um, complex trauma is relational trauma, most commonly, um, in which there's, it's, there's a lack of an ability to think of a specific event. Or there are many, many events, and child abuse would be one example of that. Neglect's a really good example of that. There's been a relational trauma, but in fact there's not one incident that you can hang it on. So EMDR is, is effective, but not, not for all trauma types. It stands for... Eye movement desensitisation response. It's about 20 years old. Wow. It's come into the mainstream a lot in the last five years. The, the, the people that invented it probably suffocated the, um, the, um, the, the, the spread of it a little bit by inventing a $5,000 machine with a red light that you'd follow. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but only, they tried to kind of, um, I guess, um, uh, put some intellectual property on it and, um, and that stopped the initial kind of spread of it. Sorry, glad we clarified that. <laughs> well, thank point. you, yeah, that's no, great. It kind of answers some traumas, you know, in terms of when you've had traumas yourself, hmm. isn't it? This slide is about prevalence of infant mental health problems. As I mentioned, there's DC 0 to 3R, which has now become DC 0 to 5. And in, there's very few studies which actually look at infant mental health problems, um, but the highest quality one comes from Scandinavia, where a huge amount of child psychiatry um, studies come from, and it's because of their population databases. They're able to demonstrate that, depending on what you include, between 8 and 20% of the 0 to 4 year old pop population meet criteria for an infant mental health disorder, which is exactly the same um, co um, correspondence with the psychopathology that you see in, in childhood and in adolescence. And of those, 9% of them have a long-term mental health problem. Um, the disorders which have the greatest continuity are anxiety disorders and behavioural problems. I think James will talk about behavioural problems um, today and I'd like to just touch on them and we'll speak mostly about anxiety. Um, the New Zealand, I'd just like to make the point that New Zealand has none of this data. Um, a very recent piece of high quality work that came out from the Ministry of Health in 2018, the social, emotional and behavioural difficulties in New Zealand children 
didn't collect any data for the 0 to 3s. Uh, they found that in children aged three to four years, they had the highest rates of total concerning difficulties. So their total score, uh, so 10% of the population fell within um, the total difficulties scores, which converts to a population figure of 12,000 children. Um, it's thought that probably the, the tool that was used for this, the Strengths and Difficulties questionnaire, probably is not very useful for uh, non-Pākehā populations uh, and possibly under reports. So I guess just, just in case I haven't made it <laughs> amply clear, early intervention in response to difficulties experienced by a child is a worthy goal in and of itself. The relief of distress and dysfunction in childhood is important, but it can also reduce the risk and the severity of some types of mental disorder later in childhood, through adolescence and into adulthood, and it can improve developmental, emotional, academic and social outcomes. The earlier the intervention, the greater those improvements are. So just briefly, behavioural disorders. Very clear evidence um, that um, the behavioural disorders, the earlier you intervene, um, the better. It's also really important to say that the behavioural disorders, which is where children are acting out distress, these parents want help. The preschool teachers want help, the schools want help. We have many effective approaches for parenting, for children and for school. I don't know why we're still waiting for adolescents to really begin to intervene with behavioural disorders. 50% of children identified with behavioural problems as preschoolers continue to have that problem through childhood, through school, um, into adolescence and early adulthood with very high rates, approximately 1 in 10, of ending up in criminal behaviour in the juvenile court system. You know your comment about why we're waiting for adolescents and that when I've had to deal with my cancer and have conversations about the younger children and can we do something now? The, the, the comments back is we can't diagnose, we don't like to diagnose, we can't, we've got to wait till they're 16, wait till they're 14 mm -hmm. and working in welfare, which is our field, it's, it's quite frustrating. But, and that's why I like your comment about the early, or the quiet about the early intervention and getting it's convincing others to have that same. Yeah. And, and, and importantly, in fact, the most effective interventions um, are delivered in, in early childhood. Mm -hmm. So um, five, six, seven years mm -hmm. um, has the highest rates um, of success mm -hmm. overseas and they're absolutely delivered with a total smattering in New Zealand. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting one. Yeah, um, yeah, don't start me. <laughs> yeah. Well, I hope that your infants and children are receiving the same share of the budget as the adolescents mm -hmm. and of people with training and expertise. <laughs> we wish. <laughs> Don't start me. You've got to start somewhere. I think you start with law and you start with names and you have to follow. Um, we really don't have much in the way of infant mental health services in New Zealand. Um, they're essentially clustered in Auckland. So now I'd like to talk just a little bit before I run out of time. Yeah, it's more um, tea. Sorry. <laughs> it's um, all right. I'd like to talk a little bit about, um, it is opposed to the externalising behavioural disorders, the under-controlled disorders in which children tend to externalise um, and act out internal conflicts. The internal disorders, um, they have fears and worriness, worrying and unhappiness. In fact, internalising disorders cause more distress to the child than, than those around them, um, and as a result, their pickup is considerably lower, which is why I think it's quite important to give it a mensch. Um, so it wasn't very many years ago that anxiety disorders in children were thought to be quite rare and, um, uh, and low impact conditions. But, um, We've recently seen, there's recently been a huge explosion in our knowledge about child exam anxiety, and we've got a really good understanding of its nature, its development, and its treatment. Um, we've also started um, in the early childhood field in the research literature, perhaps not so much in practice, on looking at um, prevention of anxiety um, and the overlap um, as this moves into childhood. The core feature of anxiety disorders 
as avoidance. In most cases for children, this includes overt avoidance, but it might also include subtle forms of avoidance, hesitancy, uncertainty, withdrawal, ritualised actions, lining things up, rubbing one's hands, shaking one's fists. And these are quite consistent across disorders. Um, the avoidance is often accompanied by shyness, which is really important because, behave, as we'll come to see, this is actually part of its genesis. Um, children at, at, at early ages have difficulty verbalising these emotions. And um, in, in identifying anxious children, it's quite important um, to think about, uh, to watch their behaviour, and also think about it when they present with physical disorders, particularly stomach aches and headaches. Um, but also um, nausea and vomiting, um, diarrhoea, uh, uh, and, and difficulty with sleep. So this, so anxiety disorders commonly begin at the age of four. It's one of the earliest disorders to appear, and it's one of the most stable. It has very low rates of spontaneous remission, and in adolescence, it, it, there's an increased risk of anxiety and mood disorders, and in adulthood, there's an increased risk of anxiety, mood disorders, substance abuse, and suicide. There is very little spontaneous remission, um, as I've said, but they're enormously treatable, and some of them extremely easily, which is why it's really important um, that there's early recognition and management of these disordered disorders. Um, one of the, high, the most important risk factors to be aware of is um, that the temperamental trait called behavioural inhibition um, almost entirely leads to anxiety disorders, and behavioural inhibition is genetic and runs in families. What this means is that these are people who withdraw in the face of, of novelty. So when something new is happening, they, they tend to not smile, and they're quiet, there's limited eye contact, and they make, take proximity to their attachment figure. You also see this in people who are slow to warm up to strangers and go on to have social anxiety, and an unwillingness to do new things. There's an, a whole lot of free um, online screeners that if you meet a kid that you were thinking in your practice, oh, I wonder if this kid's got anxiety, and it's the, the, the scared one is um, free and online has some questions from it. Um, very straightforward. Um, when I feel frightened, it can feel hard to breathe. Um, I don't like to be with people I don't know very well. I've done this with five-year-olds. They totally get this. If you've got anxiety and you ask people these questions, they, they know what you're talking about. So this is scored up on a three-point scale, and kids really like it. Anxious children really like you to ask about these things that they can't actually put words to. So even identifying anxiety and naming it helps. I know that labelling is a bit of a controversial notion, but labelling can mean that for children, it's not actually the way that they are, and this is called an externalising approach. And it helps the child recognise that this isn't a core and essential part of them, that this is something, a part of them that's a monster that needs to be fought in order for them to get to school and enjoy their friendships. In fact, a lot of the, a lot of the reason that I've seen children is that, and in, this, in this setting is that the parents are anxious and have experienced social anxiety and they're noticing that their modelling is affecting their children. And so in fact they present their child to treatment. And in fact, I've also had families in which the child receiving treatment is actually the conduit through which the adults receive treatment as well. There's some beautiful um, online apps for this and um, some excellent books. And they, they have really lovely low key approaches teaching breathing, teaching mindfulness, um, finding feelings in your bodies, um, and then some cognitive-based approaches to, to being addressing these things. It's simply about um, managing your body while you're being a bit braver and some exposure therapies. Really effective young. So, just to finish, I ask you, what do we want for our future generations? <laughs> I hope that the, I've demonstrated there's a lot we can do in the field of infancy and early childhood. Um, we can focus on the soil, on caregiving, um, well-being, our community, and nurturing caregivers. But we also need to think about, about seed um, and believe in infant mental health problems. I think we really do need to start thinking about this and developing some New Zealand orientated solutions because um, this is a culturally rich time um, in which solutions need to come from within us collectively as a society. And I, I think we've seen some really fantastic homegrown developments um, in this field already, and we're going to need a whole lot more. Thank you. Thank you.